Uh, welcome everyone uh, to this uh, webinar. Uh, today we have Professor Fernando Villegas from uh, ICTP uh, in Trieste, Italy. Um, let me briefly introduce our speaker. Uh, Professor Villegas is a senior research scientist at the International Center for Theoretical Physics uh, in Trieste. Uh, he did his uh, initial studies in mathematics uh, in Argentina from where he, he belongs. And then he moved to the Ohio State University for his PhD. Uh, prior to joining ICTP, he has held uh, positions at several reputed institutes, including uh, the Institute for Advanced Study, uh, Princeton University, and the University of Texas at Austin. He is widely known for his work in number theory, geometry, and combinatorics, and he has won several distinguished fellowships and awards. Uh, today, we are very pleased that he has accepted our invitation, and he's going to speak about uh, the mathematics of the football. Professor Villegas, uh, over to you. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I just noticed I might need to do something with the arrows to go back if I need to from the slides. So I I want to uh, welcome you all and thank you so much for attending the talk. Um, my talk will be we'll start with the football and uh, move on to um, uh, some mathematics in, in between, but I'll touch a whole bunch of other aspects um, of, of a similar problem. I mean, I gave this similar talk uh, before and I had focused it on the football, but I, as I was uh, researching the subject, um, I found that, that there was a bigger theme and, and that's what I would like to um, talk about. So let's start with the football and then I'll, I'll tell you more about this thing. So here are the two footballs uh, from the years that you see, 1930 and 2018, the actual footballs that were used for the World Cup. And uh, you can clearly see a difference. And, um, and what I would like to uh, concentrate uh, today is on how these footballs were actually constructed. So these um, have to hold so, some air so that they're light. They have to be strong. Football is gonna be kicked around very forcefully. And you wanna build it in a fairly simple way. Certainly early on, you want um, you know, too many sophisticated techniques. Um, so you want to make uh, something which is roughly a spherical a sphere made out of pieces that are all sort of the same to keep things uh, simple. And uh, so here we see what was uh, used in 1930 and what was used in 2018 was the sign. You know, it's made out of pieces that are sewed together, at least originally and uh, put together to form uh, something like a sphere. So as we move on in time, we see uh, how this uh, design uh, changed slightly. Um, these are the, all the uh, footballs that were used for the corresponding um, World Cups. And you see, um, the names of the football and the countries where the World Cup was held and the year. And I'll, um, I, as a general rule, as a general uh, thing to, to be aware of, if you play football, you know, and if you attend math lectures, you also should know, is that you keep your eyes on the ball. So um, I'd like to ask you to do that. So this is one set of footballs, and this is another one from 1974 to 2002. We see it here um, a change of design from the previous page and also um, uh, something else. So what is um, one of the notable features of um, this set of footballs and the previous one that we saw. And I'm gonna to try to see if I can go back, but I've had a 
hard time doing that. Um, if I click my mouse, it simply goes forward. Anyway, I'll leave it at this. I mean, you, you recall what the other ones look like. So maybe I quickly ask if somebody can tell me what's the difference between the two set of balls. Somebody wants to uh, answer that. No? Well, it's difficult to do this kind of interactive thing on Zoom. Um, well, there's differences in the design that we mentioned, the, the way the, the different pieces have been put together and the shape of the pieces. But there's also a difference that the uh, previous uh, collection of balls that were from 1934 to 66 um, were of different, of different color. These uh, that we're seeing now uh, mostly are of two colors and at least uh, the very first ones are in black and white. And the reason for that change is television. Um, you wanted to be able to see the football on a TV. And so um, the contract of black and white, which is what TVs were at the early stages, is what was uh, important so that people at home watching on TV could, could see. All right, so the, the theme is um, how do we build something, um, for example, like a, like a sphere, like a ball, or um, in the case that I'll start with is dimension two, um, a paving, say, of the floor of your house or a road, um, with pieces that are uh, all roughly of the same shape because you want to keep things simple and you want to keep things uh, also cheap. Um, and you want to try to minimize the cost of doing it. And so, you know, we, we all live in, in dimension three, but let's start in dimension two to ask a, a, a question like this and see what um, what uh, solutions there are to to this uh, sort of um, general problem? So, if we want to make something reasonably simple, uh, you want pieces that are all um, as regular as as possible, and um, we know that in the, in two dimensions those would be the regular polygons. Uh, and here we see uh, from uh, three, four, five, six, uh, seven sides. So if we want to use these as tiles to make, um, uh, to cover um, a floor, uh, something flat, then we know that uh, this can be done in this uh, three different ways only. Um, we can have uh, squares, hexagons or triangles. Uh, so this would be a way to cover uh, a floor with pieces all of the same shape. And um, this of course is the um, way that uh, bees do it. Here we see um, um, a beehive and uh, how these, uh, this is a well-known uh, solution to the problem of constructing something uh, flat uh, in, a, in a sort of uh, economical way and, uh, and also in a simple way. And, um, but this uh, kind of solution also appears uh, in a completely natural way. For example, here we see a picture of this um, uh, place in Bolivia, which is, um, uh, is, is salt, a salt mine. Um, I'm not quite sure how you call it. Um, but here, you see all this material we're seeing is salt and um, it's not quite as regular as the bees uh, uh, done it, but 
it basically has a, a fairly similar structure that came up uh, completely uh, naturally. The, this, this type of hexagonal uh, paving uh, also appears in the structure of graphite. Uh, graphite is one form, one stable form of, uh, of uh, molecules made out of uh, purely of carbon. And this is something that we'll come back to. So in two dimensions, there isn't a whole lot of um, secrets. Um, if you want to, the solutions to the problem of make, building something flat with, in two dimensions with pieces all roughly the same size, um, doesn't have a whole lot of uh, variation. But um, when I was looking at uh, this, uh, mentioning this in, in, uh, in a talk, I, um, I was a little shocked to be honest that there is a question known as the honeycomb conjecture, which is um, something that goes back to the year 36 before Christ uh, in, uh, in, in, in Rome, where uh, maybe it wasn't as precisely um, um, formulated as a mathematical conjecture as in this paper, but this paper presents a solution and this paper is for 2002. And the conjecture is that if you uh, build something with uh, shapes uh, with a fixed area, but you want the, uh, the minimum um, uh, perimeter, then um, you, you should build it uh, as the piece do it with, with hexagon. And so this is a mathematical proof of this that is um, very, very late in time. So um, even something as deceptively simple as, as this question for paving in the plane um, was only resolved, I mean, it's not like it will surprise anyone, but if we wanted an actual mathematical proof, this was only um, written out in detail by uh, Thomas Hales in 2002. So if we move to, um, so go back to this issue, if we try to pave things with um, other types of shapes, um, if we keep them to be regular so that they're sort of a simple format, uh, you know, a simple calculation will show you that you, you cannot do it uh, paving, in other words, covering entirely a something flat um, with uh, polygons other than, than the triangles, squares, and hexagons. So if you tried the pentagons or hexag uh, septagons or oct octagons, you'll see pieces that are um, that are missing. Now, if you uh, allow yourself to do this um, with a little bit more um, cost or, or complication um, or needing a bit more sophistication, then of course you can do a lot of other things. Um, and so I just wanted to show you, you know, I'm sure you've seen thing like this. Um, and I did not think of uh, looking into Indian designs, and I'm sure there are plenty, but let me show you the famous uh, Alhambra. So these are actual photographs of uh, floors in the Alhambra, which is this, uh, this amazing place in Spain that the Arabs, uh, when they were there, uh, constructed a, a big palace. And so here you see a lot more variation and, uh, and there's a whole lot of mathematical interesting um, things behind doing pavings like this if you allow yourself to have more uh, sophisticated uh, types of uh, pavings and the, the, the pieces themselves are complicated and arranged in a more complicated way. Um, for example, you can have things that are 
um, non-periodic as well. And this is um, a whole lot of uh, different direction, a very interesting one, but um, we are not gonna um, go there uh, in any detail. So again, for example, if you start mixing uh, pieces of different sorts, even the regular ones, you can do things like this. <clears throat> or of course, things like this. As we all have seen um, the drawings of Escher. All right, so this is all I wanna say about dimension two and let's move to dimension three, which is back to our um, football. So now in dimension three, we would like to uh, use uh, simple um, pieces all to uh, the largest extent um, the same to build up a something that encloses space and um, ideally that is as close to a sphere as we can. For example, maybe how do we take pieces of some material, say le uh, leather, cut them up into all pretty much the same pieces and uh, build and put them together to make a football. So. You know, we know since ancient times that um, if the analog of the polygons, the regular polygons uh, in three dimensions uh, are only these five platonic solids, um, which are uh, made out of um, themselves as faces that are all uh, themselves, they're regular polygons of a fixed number of sides. So we have uh, these five platonic solids. And these platonic solids have loomed large in, 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 um, in the imagination of, uh, of people. Um, perhaps the most um, remarkable is this uh, work by Kepler. Who, of course, Kepler is a famous astronomer and uh, formulated uh, these laws that allows us to understand how planets move in, uh, in, the, in the universe. But uh, he also had some ideas that now would be considered a little bit uh, strange. Uh, so he had a way to think of how these planets um, were surrounding the sun um, uh, or the earth. Uh, I'm not that, uh, that I... Uh, not that verse on the details, but you see anyway, the, my point is to just talk about this picture where he liked to think of the planets uh, as, uh, as moving in orbits that are put together like the, these platonic solids one inside the other. So this is uh, the whole way of thinking of the planets connected to the platonic solids. Now, um, <clears throat> The platonic solids also, um, you know, they're natural shapes and once you find them, you, you could um, const construct them for various uh, purposes. And uh, one thing that I found while looking into, into this is uh, things like this. This, um, this is um, it's called a Roman dodecahedron. So it is indeed a dodecahedron uh, uh, with a few extra features made out of um, some metal. And, um, and they found uh, all over Europe, hundreds of these buried and uh, nobody seems to exactly know what they were for. And there's also even icosahedra, which uh, we see one at the uh, bottom right so this icosahedron is um, built out of triangular faces. Now, <clears throat> moving on to, um, so we, we all live in three space. We, we all um, um, share the same physical constraints. So including uh, other forms of life and um, they come up with uh, solutions to, to their problems that are still controlled by the same uh, constraints of uh, geometry and physics that everything else. 
So we see, for example, this is a, a famous book that talked um, about the of Herschel about the shapes and geometry of living uh, objects. And, um, and you see here, uh, for example, the top uh, left, um, what looks like an icosahedron. And this is, uh, I don't quite know what the name is of some actual living creature that has that form. Um, more connected to art, um, this is a picture um, from a place called the um, Monte Verita Foundation, which is, um, as it happens, is, a, is used now as an a, as a institute, um, as a place, a conference center for, for various conferences. I happened to actually be there a couple of summers ago because it's um, the uh, ETH in Zurich has a, has a, um, they do a school there, I think once, a, once every summer. So this, anyway, it, this is a um, icosahedron that had to do with dance in, in a way I not surely fully understand. It was a, a free dance school founded by this person, Rudolf von Laban. So this actual metal um, icosahedron is in the grounds of this foundation. Um, it's a very interesting place that had a uh, now, as I said, it's mostly just a conference center, but it used to be uh, the place where there was a, a, a community that, um, that lived there and founded the place, a, which has a very interesting history. Anyway, the, this is just to say that these, these uh, geometrical shapes uh, have, uh, have a way to sort of showing up um, in various ways uh, connected to to actual living objects, and as, as we'll see, um, also sort of chemist. Uh, um, and um, and they, they always seem to sort of, um, sort of uh, uh, trigger the imagination of, of artists and, um, and, uh, and scientists. Um, okay, so, um, the one thing I, I want to um, talk about, the mathematics, it, it will be fairly um, basic and it goes back to uh, Leonard Euler in the late 1700s. And he um, described this basic formula that if we have one of our uh, solids uh, made out of um, faces that are themselves polygons, um, we are going to find that the relation of the number of faces, F, the number of edges, E, and the number of vertices, V, of the object in this combination will always add up to two. So for example, a dodecahedron has 12 faces. Uh, here, I forgot to change the S, because this was from a talk I gave in Italian, the S should be an E. Of edges, <clears throat> and um, and these uh, two dodecahedron and icosahedron are dual in the sense that if you um, take a, a vector perpendicular to the faces, say of the dodecahedron, then and put a, a a point at the end of a normal vector of unit length from the from the face you will be getting the vertices uh, of a icosahedron. So in this duality, <clears throat> the number of faces uh, from, from one uh, becomes the number of vertices of the other and vice versa. And here's a, a picture of the paper um, published by Euler <clears throat> where you see um, in, is in Latin as it, the way this is the somewhat universal language for science at the time. And you see here the formula with um, the letters S, S, H, and A, but um, exactly the formula that we discussed. 
And if we look <clears throat> at our five platonic solids, this is what uh, we see, um, these uh, various quantities, number of faces, edges, and vertices. Um, the biggest ones are the dodecahedron and icosahedron we already mentioned. Now, in this solids, there's another in important uh, thing to consider, which is the symmetry group. So what kind of um, um, symmetries you can have um, uh, that preserve this, um, this, uh, this object or this uh, configuration. So here you see that the top of the picture is you take the platonic solid, which was made of straight uh, faces, the edges are straight segments and so on. And you think of it as uh, inf you inflate that um, and divided uh, the faces into triangles. Uh, and you, you get a sphere where you see this um, triangles uh, as indicated in the picture, uh, which were um, uh, painted black and white so you can see the contrast. Now, so th this, um, you can think then that this may be a good way to, um, to make uh, something spherical. You can take the platonic solid and uh, kind of inflate it. But if you do that, you, you're gonna get a, if you're looking to make a ball uh, to play a game, it's not gonna be particularly good. So there are other options, which is as happened in two dimensions, which is you could, um, you could take uh, the faces to be, okay, maybe not all exactly the same, but maybe just use two kinds uh, or maybe three kinds of uh, faces. And if you do that, um, you would get these Archimedes solid. And uh, these can also be constructed by say, starting like for example, the truncated tetrahedron that we see at the top uh, left is what it sounds like. You take a tetrahedron and then you cut off, um, a, a chop off a piece, um, surround, um, you know, um, at, at the corners. You chop off corners and then you will create an object like uh, it's indicating. And if you are um, familiar, if you, if you recall the, when we were talking about the football, you'll see that the bottom left, the truncated icosahedron is exactly the shape of the football. So you can either think, okay, I made the, the, the football by, well, let me say that's the football, that was the standard one. If you ask any, anyone to, <clears throat> to draw a football, it's likely that they will draw this. I mean, this is, the, the design was started in the 70s and it lasted for quite a while. I mean, uh, at some point, te the technology became very sophisticated and started, uh, for example, the thing is that there's always a special ball for the World Cup and, um, and that design for the World Cup football has been evolving. And, um, and in fact, there's a whole thing because it, it, when there was a dramatic change in design, the uh, players were really un unhappy because the ball kind of behaved in ways that were new or uh, to them and somewhat unpredictable. But anyway, the, the absolutely standard design of a football is this truncated icosahedron. In fact, you, you look at that, you, I, um, if you think of it as inflating it a bit, you, you can easily see that that is how uh, football looks like. So we're going to focus on that truncated icosahedron. This has uh, two types of faces. Um, it has hexagons, uh, and it has 12 pentagons and 20 hexagons. And um, it has 90 edges and 60 vertices. And I'd like you to focus on the number of vertices, 60, which will be something that uh, we'll come back to. So, Here's um, on the left, the mathematical version. Uh, this is the truncated icosahedron, which 
as the name indicates, comes from taking an icosahedron and chopping off um, a piece uh, of, uh, around the vertex. So there's the 12 vertices become these 12 pentagons and the faces uh, having chopped off a piece uh, go from a triangle to a hexagon. Now, if you take that on the left and inflate it, you, you can imagine that you will get the shape on the right, which is indeed the uh, football that I was saying is the standard one, namely this that uh, officially was the football uh, Telstar for the Mexico World Cup of 1970. And I forget now, but it sort of lasted, that general shape was the one used uh, for the World Cups for quite a while afterwards. So this uh, particular <clears throat> shape was um, certainly not new. Um, the platonic solids go way back, but even these um, more complicated things were certainly known a long way back. So here there's a beautiful book by uh, somebody called Luca Pacioli that was illustrated by Leonardo da Vinci. And here is the page corresponding to the um, truncated icosahedron. So you see uh, this beautifully done rendition of now it's, it's, um, it's um, open so you can see inside, but if you think of it as uh, uh, if you were to put uh, actual uh, pieces on each uh, one of the holes, you, you'll get the truncated sahedron or, or something very much uh, resembling a football. So here's, um, here's the uh, rendition. Now, I mean, if we were all together in the same room as, as life was before, I would have an actual model. I could uh, throw it to you. You could have it in your hands and look at it, turn it around and see how it, it looks. But we have now a virtual world and here's a virtual rendition of such a thing. Um, <clears throat> if you wanna construct one, you can cut it open. And, um, and here's uh, something you could take this. And I think I took this from Wikipedia. You can print it out. Uh, cut it, cut the all the white part out, and then paste. You know, use tape to put it together, and you see the pentagons. There are twelve of them, are colored in red, and the hexagons, there's twenty of them, are colored in yellow. And there's a number there. There's something mysterious at this point called says G11 below, which we'll I'll explain in just a bit. So again. Uh, in the spirit of the virtual thing, here's a way to build it up from that piece of paper. This is what you would uh, do in, um, in actual uh, life if you, if we had a chance to do so in person. Okay, um, now to move forward, um, we can uh, try to construct something um, maybe not all the pieces the same, because if we do that, we stuck with the platonic solids. Um, and so the, I don't know what exactly came first, but these uh, mathematically, these objects are discussed now are called uh, polyhedra, uh, Goldberg polyhedra from 1937. So his um, uh, idea was to construct solids with two types of faces, hexagons and pentagons. And the requirement is that three faces of meet at one ver at each vertex. So um, if you just only two, you wouldn't go very far. And um, the resulting object has an icosahedral symmetry. So you can do the same um, things that you do to ic icosahedron and take the object to itself. So this is what he considered. And here we see the type of things that you can get. And there's a whole infinite sequence of them. This is just um, some. And in all of these pictures, um, 
except the very first one. Um, the, there are pentagons, uh, which are colored red. Everything else that is colored something else is a hexagon. So um, I want to ask you to just for a few seconds to stare at this picture, uh, these pictures, and uh, tell me later which one is the football. One of them is. At the very top left, we have the actual um, um, dodecahedron. Uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, the decahedron. Um, and then we have a whole bunch of things we haven't seen before. And you see, the, the, what happens is that there is more and more faces, the more and more pieces as we go towards the right. Um, and it looks uh, each time closer and closer to be in an actual football. So you could say, okay, well, how about I just take, you know, the very one on the right and use that to build my uh, football. But um, there are several constraints in the construction of football and suddenly you, it's unlikely that having many, many pieces would be a good thing to do. Anyway, this mathematically is what, um, what we're looking at. And these, um, turns out that these, uh, of global polyhedra, you can um, you can construct you you can describe as follows, and here this will explain this uh, one one that we had before. You see that um, if you think of uh, putting yourself on one of the pentagons on the on the shape, on the on the on the surface of this poly, polyhedron, like uh, here is this um, where this black um, thing uh, starts on the left, and then move uh, across one of the faces of the pentagon. You'll be moving to a hexagon, and you keep moving. You keep moving until um, you might have to turn, but if you do, you turn towards the next, the closest pentagon. Let's say you, you turn always to the right, for example. Then you see that uh, in this e example, um, you um, you going to move from one pentagon to another by making two steps forwards and one step to the right. And this is true for any pair of pentagons that are close to each other. You can just check. Um, uh, any other pentagon, you will always have to move two steps in one direction and then uh, one step to the right. And so that's uh, a way to classify this polyhedron by just giving those two integers, which is how you move from one pentagon to another. And now here comes the, the big, uh, possible, hopefully, if you haven't seen this before, surprise. I mean, quite a bit of a, I think, a pretty interesting fact that these polyhedrons have always 12 pentagons, no matter how many uh, faces you have. And the, this is a proof using the formula of Euler. It's quite straightforward. If P is the number of pentagons, H is the number of hexagons, well, the total number of faces is P plus H. The number of edges, um, there's five edges per pentagon, there's six edges per hexagon. So the total number would be 5p plus 6h, but if you do that, you count each edge twice because an edge is always um, common to two faces. And the same argument shows you that the number of vertices is 5p plus 6h divided by three. And now you, you put that into Euler's formula and Miraculously, the term with H disappears. Um, sorry, the, uh, uh, the one for P should disappear. And uh, you're left with just that P, um, 
sorry, what am I saying? The H disappears, so H doesn't matter. And you end up with the formula that P is 12. Okay, and uh, so um, it becomes the game of uh, Serge le Pentagon. Let's look for pentagons. So here's another instance where um, we have a ball now of golf that has been constructed um, using hexagons and pentagons. You cannot do it with just hexagons. I should have emphasized that. Um, hexagons do not close up um, without leaving space to build a sphere. Just like in the plane, you could not use uh, heptagons to cover space. So if you see something that, if you look at this ball for a little bit, you'll see that mostly the little uh, um, dents that we see on the ball are hexagons, but there has to be pentagons. And there has to be 12 of them. So let's look for them. So here's a pentagon. Here's another one. And here's another one. And we knew from uh, our simple application of Euler's formula, there, there just have to be these pentagons. And the same applies for any construction that is built in the same way. So there's another instance of where these um, type of constructions appears, which are domes. And so um, this is a very famous uh, dome that was done for the um, World um, Fair uh, in Montreal in 1967. And it was created by this uh, man called uh, Buckminster Fuller. And he created these geodesic domes, as they're called. And here we can see him in the type, in the cover of Time magazine and uh, his head made into what he made famous, which are these geodesic domes. And if you look at the way this head has been paved, you see that is, is okay, the triangles, but the triangles make hexagons. And so it has to be that there are pentagons too, because you cannot do this with just hexagons. So where are the hex the pentagons? Well, here's one. And there should be 12 of them if they were completely round. So this guy, um, Buckminster Fuller was an architect, quite a really interesting person that had very interesting ideas about design. And he had many other projects, for example, this uh, very strange looking car. I'm just gonna move quickly now because I want to get to more stuff and I'm running out of time. Here's a patent picture of the car. Constructions like this, like this, or like this. And here again, we see an instance of his dome. So we have to find a pentagon. Here it is. And uh, let me just go with the next thing quickly. Uh, in rehearsing and um, researching this, I found uh, this thing that was, I found, really uh, quite surprising. And it goes by the name of tensegrity, which is a mixture of tension with integrity. And here, for example, is, a, so you build uh, stable structures without, um, you know, uh, screws or nails. It's just made out of tension together with, with um, so the tension you is put in such a way that it keeps the thing uh, together. So for example, here's how to make a icosahedron out of rubber bands and pieces of wood. And I'm pretty sure it's not easy to do. I mean, it's easy to get to that point. Once you make it, it's gonna be stable, but getting there, I'm sure it's not easy. Here's a step-by-step -step form a description of how it can be done. Uh, this idea was something that was um, advocated by Buckminster 
uh, Fuller. Um, he he was he had a very interesting kind of philosophical approach to to architecture and to design, and this actually is uh, was used this tensegrity concept to uh, build, for example, this bridge in um, Australia. And let me show you what this this thing really blew my mind when I first saw it. So this is a very short video of constructing something in what looks like a completely um, uh, hard to believe way. Have a look. All right, I'll let you uh, investigate this on your own a little more. I want to move forward. So here is uh, people constructing uh, one of uh, Buckminster Fuller domes. Here's a house. Um, again, there's a Pentagon. And that takes me to uh, the next um, uh, topic that has to do with the same problem of constructing something uh, with small uh, pieces, all pretty much the same way. And I will go through this rather quickly because I don't have that much time. And it's a, all, this will be sort of a, a talk on its own. This, uh, the history and the, and the physics and chemistry behind this that are called buckyballs. So here's, um, again, a, a construction of a truncated icosahedron or a uh, football, but now in the context of chemistry. So these people, Croto, Curl, and Smiley, got the Nobel Prize in chemistry in 1996 for work they did in the uh, mid 80s, which is that they discovered that there was a stable form of a, mole a molecule made out of entirely of carbon that has 60 carbons. And if you recall, I said, ask you to remember the 60 vertices of a truncated icosahedron, because that's what they discovered that these um, atoms actually are uh, located like the uh, vertices of a truncated icosahedron. So in other words, the, the bonds between them form faces that are hexagons and pentagons. And here's Crotto holding a um, model of this molecule. And this became a huge deal. I mean, this is really incredible. Beforehand, uh, stable forms of uh, molecules just made out of carbon were just graphite, which I showed you before. There was this, these layers of hexagons or diamonds, which is a much more complicated structure. And the way this was done is that they shot this beam of laser to, to uh, graphite uh, in an inner gas and then these atoms were sort of floating and they let them cool and they form these clusters of atoms. And they were, look, they were trying to reproduce what they, um, what they one sees in, uh, in between uh, stars in interstellar space. And they did find what the things that one finds in interstellar space with a micro uh, well, telescope, but just sort of chains of carbon. But they also completely unexpectedly, they found, um, for example, this is an example of this, uh, the data that the, that the actual um, printout of data that, of experiments that they, they did, there was this peak which uh, they, they didn't know what it meant. So there's some class of atoms that appeared in this experiment that had, they had no inkling uh, it would show up. And here you see it's written C60 plus, question mark. And it turned out, so here's a, a more precise form of this. You see on the bottom, uh, a list of the number of atoms um, that these clusters of atoms uh, had. And there was a peak of 60. And there's also a smaller peak at 70. And it turns out that these were indeed completely new to mankind's um, 
forms of stable forms of carbon molecules, so made out of purely uh, of carbon atoms. And this, as I said, became a huge deal. If you see here, Google and uh, the British um, post celebrating that. Um, now, I wanted just to say a few words about uh, Croto, who, who was, a, um, I think uh, he passed away a few years back and he, he seemed to have been a really interesting person. And uh, he used to have a website. I, I looked today to find um, more, um, some of the things that I may have missed when I first found it. And his website now is, um, has been, has been uh, what did you say, disengaged or canceled or something. I don't quite know what happened. So anyway, um, in there, he mentions that uh, he was always, um, you know, maybe a, somewhat of a distracted student, but still nevertheless ended up doing work that for which he, he got, he shared the Nobel Prize. So anyway, he showed this letter that um, was written by, um, by one of his teachers when he was a kid in the UK uh, to his mother. And I circled, I, I put in red here the key thing. He is very fond of play. Apparently he was a terrible student. Uh, he just seemed to have spent his time playing. But he made a point that um, that was what guided his all of his scientific career. Um, so I, I thought it was an interesting thing to to consider. Um, okay. Um, let me move to the last point, uh, the last connection, which is very topical. Uh, this was not uh, what I had in mind when I first uh, thought of this talk, that we would be living in a situation with virus. A virus was uh, having such an incredible effect in our lives. But um, so viruses turn out to be that many of them have a form of essentially the form of an icosahedron. So they have shape that is, um, that is um, icosahedral in nature, has a symmetry of an icosahedron. And uh, this is another um, topic that I found in history very interesting because it's the same principle. And this seemed to us, uh, it was started by um, uh, Crick and Watson, who later discovered, uh, of course, famously the structure of DNA. But they also started by describing the structure of small viruses based um, on, on basically geometrical considerations and saying this, these viruses have a small amount of DNA inside a, some sort of a capsule that, that keeps it um, protected from, from the outside. And that small amount of, of DNA can only uh, manifest itself in only a few proteins. So in other words, it's, it's um, capsule that, that englobes the DNA has to be made basically of, uh, of, of only a few uh, types of pieces. So we are exactly, this viruses have to solve the same problem as those that made the first uh, football, how to make something um, that, that uh, englobes now DNA is thin of air made out of pieces that are all roughly the same. And uh, I find it amazing uh, to, to read about chemists and um, biochemists that um, do this by hand. So here's an example of uh, this chemist Kaspar construction of the shape of a polio virus made out of pieces of wood that he made himself. And so this paper of Crick and Watson in Nature in 1956, you can see here that they talk about the possible groups, those groups that, of symmetries that we were talking about um, and how they are associated to the platonic solids. And this is in the context of describing uh, small viruses. 
And the one thing I wanted to highlight is this, um, this phrase. So they say, it's not easy to explain a short space of why there are so few ways of building a spherical shell, but the reader can soon convince himself, this is all the times, that it is difficult by trying to draw identic identical shapes with completely cover the surface of a tennis ball. It is impossible, for example, to do this entirely with hexagons, even if the shape is irregular. The point is very well stated in Darcy Thompson's On Growth and Form, in which we find the broad general principle that we cannot group as we please any number of sorts of polygons into a polyhedron, but that the number and kind of facets in the latter is strictly limited to a narrow range of possibility, possibilities. The reason is essentially a topological one. And this is the kind of thing that we've been discussing in a context now of uh, this description of the structure of a virus. And uh, Darcy Thompson just uh, in parentheses was uh, wrote a very, very famous book on growth of form where he studies uh, what happens if we take um, one, um, one actual animal, the, 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 the actual structure of it, um, physical structure, and say, make a change of coordinates. For example, you take this fish on the left and you change the coordinates into some kind of um, whatever that is, some kind of spherical or semi-spherical coordinates. Um, and you keep that, pic that, that structure in it and you see how it looks and it gives you the structure of a different fish. So there was, this is something that sits in between art uh, geometry and um, zoology or nature. And so um, this is very much um, uh, clearly it's been an inspiration for Crick and Watson. They mentioned it explicitly. Um, but um, the one thing I wanted to say, I forgot to mention, uh, there's a whole, a bit of a controversy of who actually came up with the idea that this molecule that these guys have found uh, was actually had the shape of a truncated icosahedron of a football. Because they knew that it had 60 atoms, but they have no clue how, what it looked like. They couldn't see it. They were, all they could see, they can measure that these things that they discovered by absolute chance had 60 atoms of carbon, but they couldn't see what shape it had. And they had to uh, imagine it themselves. And there's a controversy of how that actually happened. There's a collaboration of three people at least. And uh, there was a, there's a controversy of who came up with the idea first. But uh, Croto, the one person I mentioned and showed his picture, he says that uh, his inspiration came from re remembering that he had been to the Montreal uh, Dome uh, of the World, um, uh, the World Fair in 1967. So it, it, from a mathematician is a bit ironic because it's likely that for a mathematician that would be the first thing that would come to mind. But for them, this was not something that they had at the tip of their fingers. But he remembered, uh, he said he was, a, he, he was also a sort of graphic designer on the side and he, he had a big admiration for Bagmos de Fuller. And somehow this is what uh, motivated him to think of that as the structure of the molecule that they discovered. Anyway, uh, Darcy Thompson, if anything, was also an inspiration to a lot of people in that same vein. So uh, here's a depiction of the yellow fever virus again. Uh, so not every virus has icosahedral symmetry, but apparently many do. Now, finally, just to put things into perspective, uh, we talk of various things that all have sort of um, underlying similar structures, uh, but the sizes of course are completely different. Um, a buckyball has a roughly one nanometer diameter, virus 50 nanometers, a football 22 centimeters, and a geodesic dome, again, I forgot to translate this, 76 meters. So we're talking about the same issues, the same kind of answer to the same type of problems, in a varying uh, large uh, uh, variation of scale. And finally, the important thing, of course, if you play football, is to keep the eyes on the ball. So thank you so much.
Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Villegas, for the very nice talk. Um, if I have already got some questions in the chat, but if okay. there are other questions, so please uh, use the chat option in Zoom or raise your hand and I'll uh, unmute you to, to ask the question. Uh, let me ask uh, the questions that I have already got. Um, so one question was, uh, you mentioned the honeycomb conjecture. Uh, is there any connection with the spear packing problem? If so, what? Um, there must be. I don't know directly. The um, fierce packing has to do with density. Uh, the honeycomb has to do with perimeter. It's sort of a, the you know the the isoperimetric inequality is about smooth uh, curves. Um, if you if you have a string and you want to capture the biggest area with a string, what shape you would take a circle. Uh, this is sort of that, but but the you can you, you we talk about polygons. So um, um, so I think um, they they are related, but uh, I'm not sure exactly how. I, I this is not my field, so I don't quite know the answer to that. Uh, another question that I have got was uh, how does one prove Euler's formula? That's a great question. Um, I think um, I don't recall. I mean, maybe you prove it by induction. You you sort of um, uh, add one more. Um, say, take it. If you think of uh, proving the formula for for shapes that are um, are all uh, sort of polygonal, maybe you add one more cut um, and argue how how much the um, the numbers of faces, uh, vertices, and edge uh, and edges change. I think that some approach of this sort, I think, is the way uh, you typically do it. I don't recall, but it's a good question. Yeah, maybe you should try to investigate that yourself. Um, another question that I got was: uh, so when you showed the two-dimensional uh, tilings, uh, all the pieces were the same. Yeah. What happens if the pieces are different? Um, um, I do not know exactly. Um, I showed a few examples just to give a sense of variations that one can have. Again, this is something that I'm interested in, but it's not, you know, my main uh, field. So um, I do know that um, there is an issue of the symmetries of patterns that tile. Um, a, the plane, and there the my memory is that there are seventeen different groups, um, and so there's um, so for example, I I think there was a, a big thing about uh, are those seventeen groups of symmetries represented in some tiling in the Alhambra, for example, or maybe in sort of Arab Arabic art in general. Um, and uh, I think the answer is yes, but again, I don't know the precise details. Um, another question was, uh, so I think you already answered it towards the end. So the question was, was there, was there any mathematics used in the discovery of buckyballs in chemistry? Yeah, I think the actual, I think the answer is likely to be no. I mean, um, I read various descriptions. I mean, there's a description. There were the, the, the two main scientists were, were um, Crodo and Smiley. Uh, Curl, I think, was a graduate student. I mean, not to mean uh, in any derogatory sense, but he was somewhat of a less of a fundamental player. Um, and so, and their descriptions, in fact, there were several other people involved in this lab where they were doing this experiment. And they, I think all of them had uh, at some point or another gave a description of what, how it happened. I think it's a fascinating story of the whole uh, process of discovery. Um, but I think none of them really had a very, very sort of mathematical background. So the, the whole thing with the, with the icosahedron came kind of slowly. In fact, the, the, one of the main controversies is that Crotto says um, that he had uh, suggested that it was um, like like the um, icosahedron, uh, like this um, football, because of this connection with Max Minster Fuller and having gone to the to the Montreal 
a World Fair. And, um, and Smiley um, said that he uh, spent all night uh, 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 working with uh, tape, uh, scissors, and paper to try to put together something that will account for all the physical or chemi chemical constraints that he knew uh, uh, was necessary for a ball, for something like this to be to be stable. Because you can imagine it could it could have pieces of things of carbon that are sort of sticking out to. Uh, so it wasn't even clear that it would have to be like a ball. It could have been a graphite that is made out of a layer. So. There was, there was, I mean, now in retrospect, it seems like maybe a somewhat more, not obvious, but at least more natural thing that this is the answer. But I think they has simply no clue. So they had to start from nothing. But my sense is that there wasn't a whole lot of mathematics that they were, uh, they were using. It was more uh, intuition and in one case, uh, actual physical working with paper and scissors. Uh, Darshan has a question. I'll unmute uh, Darshan. He can ask himself. All right. Darshan, please unmute and ask. Uh, go ahead, Darshan. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I can hear you now. Yeah, please unmute again. Yeah. Uh, hello, sir. Can you hear me? Yes. I can hear you. Yeah, sir. My question is that. No, we don't hear. I think his, uh, his connection is not, not very strong. OK. Uh, maybe maybe we can we... it in the chat or? Yeah, so he has already typed it in the chat. So maybe I'll just ask you. So he, his question was, uh, what was the purpose of creating the large buckyball in the expo? Was it something mathematical or? Um, it's interesting that you presented that way. Of course, the, the, the expo came first, right? I mean, uh, 20, something like 20 years earlier. Um, there was no buckyball until 1986 or so. Um, the I this um, as I try to say a little bit about Buckminster Fuller. As I said, he he was an architect and designer, and and he he had very interesting ideas as to um, what what uh, structures uh, how a structure should be built. And I think one of the principles was simplicity. And, um, and I think he, he, he came up with this idea of, so it's not, I mean, one shouldn't underestimate what it means to create something that big that is, is a roof, right? I mean, it's, it's like a, you know, creating the Duomo of Milan or of, of Firenze, it's, it's, it's a highly complicated architectural problem. Um, and this is sort of on the same spirit, but he, he had pride his principles of having things done in a simple way. And this tensegrity is built in there. You, you want to use the tension to, to your own advantage, but to keep things uh, being stable and sturdy and so on. Um, so as he, he constructed these domes uh, in many different uh, places, he, he, he um, you know, he, became, as you saw in the Time magazine uh, cover, I mean, he became kind of almost uh, synonymous to these geodesic domes. And uh, they were all made with these tubes. So you saw these guys building it up uh, that make this triangle. So it's sort of the same principle. You build something uh, stable, sturdy, um, pretty sophisticated with fairly sm simple pieces. I think that was kind of what he, uh, these domes is what he arrived at following these principles. Uh, I, I, may, I may be over interpreting, but I think that's somewhat uh, what it is. So I, I read that uh, uh, Buckminster Fuller was, uh, was also a friend of uh, Donald Cogsetter. Uh, uh huh, yes. Uh -huh. But I'm not sure if, if that had anything to do with the uh, inspiration for the ball. 
I don't know. I don't know. Um, yeah, I think it, the whole, to me, this whole various things that I mentioned during the talk are, are you know, um, should be possible starting points for for research um, because the stories that they connect to are, I find, are all very interesting and suddenly this is one of them. But I have to say that I don't think that, um, I don't get a sense that Buckminster Fuller was particularly mathematical. It was more, more, um, more on this sort of uh, philosophical even uh, side of, of, um, of architecture, of structure building. Um, Somavo has a question. Somavo, can you please unmute and ask? Uh, sir, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Oh, okay, sir. Uh, sir, my question is that, uh, is there any similar type of problem uh, the sphere is re replaced by any other shape like ellipsoid? Hmm. Um, I haven't seen or thought of it. I mean, I would imagine that to a large extent, there should be fairly similar problems, but I, I may be missing something. Um, I guess you certainly are gonna need to, to change the, sh the size of things to, to get that um, ellipsoidal form. Um, but at least, I don't know, I'm just kind of thinking at the top of my head, uh, some of the features should be fairly similar, but I, I don't know what else is that might be missing. Uh, there is a question in the chat again. So uh, the question is, how does the icosahedral structure of the football help in playing football? I think that's a very interesting question. Um, I was just, when I'm preparing this today, I was wondering, well, you know, if we, if you think, why don't you, why don't we use, um, you know, whatever the octahedron shape uh, and truncate it or something and make a ball with that. I think, I'm not entirely sure, but, and so I think the answer is connected to the fact that that has the largest symmetry group. Now, why is that useful? Um, I don't exactly know. Now, let me just say one other thing that I didn't touch upon, which is a slight tangent to the question, which is, um, let's say that technology is advanced enough uh, that you can make a ball like a beach ball. You know, you can make it in one piece, right? You make it a whatever material, the sturdy and everything. I mean, that, that's, that issue is not there, but you make it to completely smooth. Why would that not be good? You know, just go all the way, forget the, forget the pieces, just forget the symmetry of a sphere, you, you know. Well, the thing is that that's a terrible ball to play any game. And you probably have this experience. If you ever played with a, with a beach ball, you know that it just behaves terribly. Um, and, this is something that has to do with the physics of moving in the air. So that's, that's a, yet another direction to this whole discussion. We, like for example, why, does, why do golf balls have dimples anyway? Um, and it was discovered, I, my understanding is also by chance that, um, that the dimples, the irregularities on the, sh on the surface of these balls help them move in the air faster and more and, and more stably. And that um, is a phenomenon that is, is understood uh, from the physics point of view, and you can model it on, on wind tunnels and so on, that, um, that the irregularities uh, help the, uh, to, to, to diminish the, um, the, uh, the, the, the friction, the, the force against moving uh, an object in the air. But um, I'm not entirely sure. I think it's a very interesting question to, to explore some more. But my feeling, my gut feeling is that it has to do with having something with the largest possible symmetry group. Uh, one more question from the chat is, uh, you, you stopped at dimension three. So what happens? <laughs> 
Well, I stop at dimension three because that's where we live. I mean, uh, at least on an er everyday basis. But uh, that's yes, that's also another very interesting question. Um, uh, Manjil mentioned Coxeter. Coxeter, as you probably know, was the master of these type of questions in any dimension. And um, you can ask the most basic question, what are the analogs of the platonic solids in higher dimensions? And there are some really interesting objects in, in more dimensions uh, like the platonic solids, they're completely regular. Um, and um, yeah, but this, I know even less. Um, uh, fortunately, so to speak, uh, we don't need to create a, a football in four dimensions, but uh, if we did, we would have to look into into these type of um, um, platonic solids, so to speak, in higher dimensions. But it, I mean, mathematically, it's a very interesting question, of course, and and the, a lot there's a lot of things we know. I I, I don't know, for example, is is there analogs of these Goldberg polytopes and what have you? I'm sure there are questions still there that are not known. So just to like close the loop. So the story about Buckminster Fuller and Coxeter, I read in uh, Coxeter's biography called King of Infinite Space. It's a very nice book. Yeah. Okay, interesting. Uh -huh. uh, so there is another question. Uh, could the icosahedral shape be contributing to the bounce factor pressure, making it more resilient? It could be. I think it's, I don't know the answer. Um, I think all of these, questions are very much worth a while exploring. Um, I don't know. I mean, you, we can extend this and ask the question also for the viruses. See, the way I see it, um, viruses and the dome and the, and the football, they're all solutions to basically the same problem. And you can ask the question as to, well, some viruses are have icosahedral symmetry, others don't. So what advantage does it give it to have this icosahedral symmetry? Is there such an advantage? Can we can we see what what that is? Um, yeah, I, I think it's very interesting to to ask. I don't know. So finally, one question that we ask uh, uh, to all our speakers is: Can you recommend some good uh, reading materials or books about these kind of things? Oof. Um, yeah. Maybe before that, before I forget, I. When I was showing the Goldberg, sorry, I, I don't know how to go back. Uh, my Zoom kind of got stuck. I don't see any arrows, so I cannot go back. But uh, uh, the, some early on slide, I showed you these Goldberg polytopes, which by the way, if you type Goldberg polytopes, you find in Wikipedia an interest, a well-written article on, the, on that picture. For, um, there were two uh, things that look like potentially could be the, the football and um, the one that it is, is the one that has the numbers one, one. So if you go from one pentagon, there's 12 pentagons, we know that. And you go from one to the other by doing one step in one direction and then turning right. Um, but you can also do two zero. And that was the one on the top uh, next to the actual icosahedron. And uh, I was just thinking this today. I, I, I don't know the answer either. So why is it the ball like that? What, why is it, uh, I mean, if, if the idea is you want to use a relatively small number of pieces, those have basically the same number of pieces. So why is one better than the other? And again, I'm not sure. As to reading material, uh, I had um, a lot of fun, I hope I transmitted this, um, in preparing this talk. I've given various versions of this talk over some time and I, I looked into it and I, and I tried to add uh, a few angles and so on. Um, so I've been basically all over the place uh, reading about this. Uh, I don't have a one text where everything is in there. Unfortunately, this website of uh, Croto that I was saying is seems to be down. I don't know what happens if there are legal issues or what have you, but that one had enormous amount of material. Um, but uh, one place, one book where to read about this, um, I wouldn't know exactly where to point you to. So thank you so much, uh, Professor Villegas, for the very nice talk and for answering so many questions. Sure, it's my pleasure. Thank you so much. I and um, and for those uh, 
that are mathematically inclined, whom I, ho I hope are most of you, uh, keep these questions and explore them on your own, you know, find out more. Uh, I think there's a lot of interesting things that can happen. I'll, I'll stop the recording now. Thank you so much again. All right. Thank you.